Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all here. Thank you for coming. My name is Charles Raymond, the project manager for Team Essence. My name is Raymond Harvey, the project manager and QA manual tester for Team Allure. And welcome to CMP 460 Applied Systems Development Project, what is also referred to as Capstone. Before we move forward, Capstone is intended to apply all of our knowledge and skills that we've gained throughout the past four years. It's not live yet. Oh, oh. <laughs> just you need to be maybe a minute, let it kind of soak, uh, let people connect up. Oh, bad, ready to roll. There you go. No, no. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all here. Thank you for coming. My name is Charles Raymond, the project manager for Team Essence. My name is Raymond Harvey, the project manager and QA manual tester for Team Allura. And welcome to CMP 460 Applied Systems Development Project, what is also referred to as Capstone. Before we move forward, Capstone is intended to apply all of our knowledge and skills that we've gained throughout the past four years, all in one assignment. This is where students function as a team of analysts and programmers to complete a comprehensive system development project. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you the hardworking and dedicated members who met consistently throughout the past four months of completing this comprehensive system development project. For team innovation, first we have Denise Daniels. Hey everyone, I'm Denise Daniels. I was a project leader, I was a system project manager, website developer, mobile application tester, and designer. Next we have Ahmad Napier. Hello everyone, I'm Ahmad. I'm the lead developer, website developer, mobile application developer. Next we have Alberto Jimenez. Hi everybody, my name is Alberto. I was a website developer and mobile app tester. Next we have Miguel Rodriguez. Hi everybody, I'm a mobile application developer as well as a mobile application tester. Then we have Eddie Jacobs. Hi everyone, I'm QA lead, website automation, manual tester, and a mobile application developer. And we have Majid Masood. Hi everyone, I'm QA tester. I, I do the manual testing and I, I do automation testing on my unique way. Now I'd like to introduce Team Essence. First we have my name is Deanna Smith. I'm the project leader, assistant project manager, website developer, mobile application developer, and database manager. Next we have. Um, hi guys, I'm author. I'm a website developer and designer. Next we have. Hi, Hello. I'm Jason. I'm the mobile application developer and I'm in charge of source control, the wiki. And I also make automated test cases for the mobile app. And I also help with web development. Next we have. Hello, my name is Gabriel Beltramieux. I am the web and app designer and QA. Next we have. Hello, I am Armand Rivera. I was part of QA, website and application automation testing and mobile application development. And lastly, we have. Hello everybody, I'm Matthew Regina and I was the QA lead, website and automation tester. All right. Um, before we get into our um, different projects, we wanted to talk about the spe specific platforms and tools that both teams use to get the projects completed. To start with, uh, um, both teams use PyCharm, which is an IDE that is uh, used mostly with Python. And our reason for choosing it was the way it integrated the Django web framework with database access that doesn't require us to use uh, another language as MySQL. Anybody who's familiar with uh, IntelliJ ID will be familiar with uh, by charm because they are made by the same company and have a similar um, appearance. And next we have Jason that will introduce us to Visual Studio. Yes, so Visual Studio is an integrated development environment from Microsoft. It's used to develop computer programs as well as websites, web apps, web services, and mobile apps. It's intentionally, it was meant for developing C-sharp programs, but it can develop Python programs as well. You can use it to develop our mobile app, or you can also use it to develop the Django websites. 
Hi, everybody. Team Alora use Android Studio, which is an integrated development environment for Google Android operating system. It's built on JetBrain IntelliJ IDEA software. We develop the application using two languages, Java and Android XML. Next, we have Eclipse, which is known for Java, but it can be used for many other programming languages. We also use this for Selenium testing. Next, we have Putty. Putty is a terminal emulation program for if you want to manage or configure on a PC. And next, we have Jason, who's going to discuss the Git. Of course. So Git is a version control system that facilitates collaboration by allowing multiple developers to work on the same project by pushing and pulling from the common branch of files. We also use AWS to host both of our servers. Both teams use AWS to host our websites. The actual site is hosted on a Ubuntu server. Um, we chose Ubuntu because it is very fast, powerful, and delivers reliably. Uh, we, we use Selenium heavily to, to write a script in, J in Java. So uh, it, it, it is a free source automa automated testing framework used to validate web application across different browser and platform. You can multiply, well, you can use multiple programming languages like Java, C Sharp, Python, other programming languages to create Selenium test script. Of course, when we're creating both our website and mobile applications, we have to worry about design. Therefore, we use Marvel, which is a software that allows us to create high-level prototypes for both our website and mobile applications. So I'd like to talk about Bugzilla. It's a website that you put that I put on my AWS server. What that does, what that does, it allows both Team Essence and Team Alora to track bugs. And that helps us make our app better because the less bugs we have, the better it is for the user to use our apps. And next we got MySQL, which Deanna will discuss. Yes. yes. So we chose MySQL because it supports Linux, Unix, and Windows. MySQL offers exceptional security features that ensure absolute data protection. In terms of database authentication, MySQL also provides a powerful mechanism for ensuring only authorized users have access to the database. Um, next, we have Goober, who's going to discuss the technology and languages that we used. These technologies are some of who we use, Python, which is a high level programming language. You can use Python for developing desktop, GUI application, and website and web application. Next is HTML, which is a markup language for creating web pages. Next, we use CSS, which is the language for describing the presentation of web pages, including colors, layout, and font. It allows one to adapt to the presentation to different types of device. Next, we have author continuing the technology and languages used. All right, um, another language that we use throughout our project is JavaScript, which is a text-based programming language that's used both on the client side and server side that allows you to make web pages interact. So features such as searches and sorting, anything that is interactive that happens on a website is usually done using JavaScript. We also have JSON, which is a lightweight format for storing and sharing mm -hmm. data. And we also have XML, which is a software and hardware independent tool for um, storing and transporting data from uh, one place to Throughout our project, we did a lot of uh, collaborating because this was a team project, um, first, first of all. One of the uh, ways we collaborated, especially during the current times, is by having weekly group meetings that allowed us to keep each other updated on our progress and figure out what the next move is and how to collaborate with each other in a more efficient way. We also had a group meet where we could exchange um, information uh, quickly, I would say. And we also had a Trello where anything that used to be, that had to be shared for um, future purposes was stored on there as well. And when we were working on our project, for example, we use Git, which is a you know a source control to share our progress with the next person, and zip files sometimes for things that needed to be tested on some other uh, server or something like that. Um, that is mostly all the. And we also had a wiki where we stored instructions 
for um, things that we figured out along the way to make it easier for somebody else to be able to uh, reproduce what we did on, for future purposes. Um, before we dive into our uh, specific projects, um, we would like to talk a little bit about the. Uh, um, we would like to talk about um, essence and what our purpose and our goal was for the project and how we uh, came up with what we did. So our goal for essence was to develop a web application that allows a user to look up airplane parts and search them using every criteria such as name, price, and material to filter results. The emphasis was building a good database that interacts with the user by showing them everything that is in the system and allows them to use primary keys and other descriptive uh, terms to search for a specific item and see things such as manufacturer number, distributor number, and as well as quantity among other things. The user will be also will also be able to add, edit, and delete items to the website using dedicated buttons that implement features that deal directly with the database without having to write any queries in any uh, database languages. And our purpose was to simply build a website and mobile application that is user friend that is user friendly and that is for internal use only. So that would mean people that only work for the company would have access to it. And it simplifies the process of keeping track of an inventory by having an individual rely on dealing straightly directly with a database or having to use Excel sheets by making features such as editing, deleting, and adding intuitive and easy to do. Um, for me personally, one of the th things that I worked on the project that I was really proud of is um, I was having difficulties implementing a search feature using JavaScript. I have basic knowledge of that language, but I've never used it for anything uh, more than you know, surface level. So while making the search feature, I had to make the JavaScript code that I was using interact directly with the HTML that was on the page and then do an elastic search as I'm typing that shows results that match what I'm looking for. So that's one of the things that I did that I'm really happy about. And now I'll pass this to Charles that will explain the website and go into more details into everything that we did. Okay, now we're gonna go straight into the website that we created. Welcome to the official Essence website. As I said before, we were given the task to develop a platform to manage a database for a company that's in the business for plane parts. So the purpose of the site was to utilize and in, for internal employees to aid the database management. So me, my my development team, web web designers and I, we went for a professional, more modern look for the layout, and we we kept the layout on mostly all the pages. So from from the jump. Without a user logged in the site, it is very limited what the outside can see due to being an internal platform. But before we log in, let's view the general screens that do not require user authentication. So we have the first view button, de first view details button here, which will bring us to the inventory page. But like I said before, this is an internal platform, so only internal employees will be able to see this page. So let's go back to the home page. Our second view details brings you to the contact page where you can see our goals and purposes, but not only you can see, not only you can see our goals and purposes, but you can see our team that actually worked on the project itself. You can also click on the contact button to send any of us an email. Now, the third detail button brings us to our FAQ question, where you can click on frequent questions and view the answers of them as well. Now, let's log in with a pre-created super, super user. And to, super users can be created upon request, which allows no restrictions on that account. But we'll get in more detail when we get to the admin screen. With us authenticated, now we can view three more tabs in the header, the inventory, admin, and account page. Let's first view the inventory page, which includes the main functionalities of our site. As you can see, 
We have created a table where you can view a live database. This table is directly connected to MySQL, so any edits in here will be pushed automatically to the database. We also created some tools. The tools to view the database more efficiently. So we have, you can show 10, 25, 50, and even 100 on one page. We also have the search bar, as explained by Arthur before, where you can search anything in the database. So say if you want to go on a random page and we want to type in, we want to find something that has contained bulk. So we just type it in here. And all every, everything that, that includes bulk will show up on the pages. As you can see, we have 66 entries out of 856 that contain bolts. And mind you, the search bar is not case sensitive, so you can type in upcase and lowercase. Another example, if we search by bin number, all the rows contain the letters. If we type in UD, as you can see, everything containing UD will pop up in the, in the table. We, we have two add buttons located in the top and the bottom of the page, where you can also add an entry to the database. And then when you click on the add button, a modal pops up. And in the modal, we have created a form that Django reads in the back end code. Most of the fields are character fields, which means you can type letters and numbers besides the quantity and date fields. So let's do a test. These are the fields where you have to enter a number or we'll get an error. So we just click add here. And we filter by the date. And we'll pop up at the top. And also, you can also add, edit data as well. If you click on the edit screen, it will bring you to the another form page that we created and you can add, you can edit anything in this database just edit that or submit oh make sure you enter the stock quantity as well and there we go there's the edit of the new of the new database we also have a delete function where you can delete a row as well, but we'll just keep this for now. Next we have is, is the admin screen, which is the back end, back end for admins. And if, if your account is not set up as an admin or super user, when you click on this tab, it will prompt you to a login screen. And that way you can log in as an admin or a user. So first we have the accounts, the accounts page where you can view, edit and create users. You can also give them permissions, such as giving them admin, a staff, or a super user. You can also change their password as well. And if you go back, we can also have the groups, groups page. We can also give permissions. We can give permissions to different users where you can view, add, edit the data in our database. And last but not least, we have the parts the parts inventory page where the admin can edit and view the data on the back end if I'm going through the website. Last but not least, we have our account page where users can change, they can change their email, their username, and they can also change their password as well. So that's a very unique feature if they want to choose a new password. And that's everything with the essence like now i'm gonna pass it off to jason to show off our website all right ah, sorry yes i would like to present my mobile app so deanna would you like to tell us anything about our mobile yes. app before we yes. begin so our mobile app s app is a mobile interface of our website essence 
It basically has um, similar functionalities as the website, but it's predominantly read only. The app is available for both Apple and Android users. Now that Deanna has explained the mobile app, I would like to go over the software development lifecycle for my app. First, I'm going to go over the requirements. Now, as a mobile developer, I thought it was it should have been our responsibility to make sure that our app runs on all devices, and that includes Android devices and iOS devices. And to make that possible, one of our requirements was that we needed to use the platform called Xamarin. And what Xamarin is, it's a cross-development platform. And what that means is when you develop one project, you can deploy it to both Android and iOS. And another one of the requirements was that we needed to be able to connect our app to the database. So we used a package called Refit. And what that does it's, is it's a REST API client. What that does is it's going to make an HTTP request to our website essence. That way it can gather our data and display it on our app. Now I want to talk about the development of our app. So to develop our app, we had to use Visual Studio. And the reason why we chose Visual Studio is because it's an excellent IDE for collaboration. One of the collaboration tools that Visual Studio has is its built-in Git features. We have buttons that make it easy for the developer to push and push to our repository without learning, having to learn how to use Git. This makes it convenient for our developers to collaborate quickly. And another collaboration feature of Visual Studio is Live Share. What that does, it allows two people to work on one file at the same time. And the purpose of that is because it takes more than just one person to work on one file. Sometimes you can get stuck, but with the help of others, you can tackle that down and figure out how to write your program very quickly. So now I want to go over the design of the app. Now, at first, designing the app was difficult because it was the first time I've ever made a mobile app. But I was able to figure it out. So the first time, um, the first first time, the app didn't really look like much. We we spent many weeks trying to figure out how to design well small things, small parts of the app, and it took very long because we've had to figure out figure it out on our own. At that time, the only full developers were me and Armand. So even though these were small things, we worked very hard to figure out these small things. One by one, we put these small things together to make it into something bigger. And when it was time to show off our app, well, at first, it didn't look like much. So we needed some help. And that's when Deanna and Goober came in. And that changed the design of the app entirely. So Deanna, right. would you like to tell us about the changes in the app? Right. So with the new design, um, me and Goober joined the mobile app team, and we decided to make sure that the app um, basically looks very similar to the website. Um, we tried to get the layout, the logo, and everything lined up so that it could appear that the app was as close as possible to the actual website. Thank you, Deanna. Now we're going to move on to testing. Of course. So in order to test the mobile app, I had to I had to make the QA team download an emulator in order to test it. But that proved to be a challenge because not everyone has a fast enough computer to run an emulator. So I had to come up with a solution. It took, a, it took me a while to figure it out because at first I had to go through three different emulators to see which one would work. None of them would work. So in order to solve that solution, I offered to use my computer as a remote desktop in order to use my emulator. And that's what it would be at first. And eventually, 
I found a way to allow the QA team to test a real device remotely. So I will demonstrate that right now. Allow me to open my camera and show that to you. All right, Deanna, can you tell me if you see anything? Yes. All right, so this Thank is the, um, the emulator for the app. Basically, um, this is the main login page. We have our logo and the actual login. So we were actually able to successfully link the database to the same database as the website. So the same login that I have for the website is the same as the app. So now I'm going to go ahead and log into the app. And also you can't create an account for the app. You do need to uh, contact your local administrator. So now I'm going to go ahead and log in. So here we have um, our team name, a picture, and then just the actual layout of the app. The app is actually read only, um, whereas the website, you can make several changes with the inventory page, whereas the app is just more of a down version of the website. So first we have the FAQ page. The FAQ page is just pretty simple and straightforward because you can't, again, do much to the with the app. So you can't change your password on the app. You can't create a login. Um, the inventory does match. Um, so these are just pretty standard FAQs into the point. Now, excuse me, Deanna. Yes. No, I, I would like to present. Um, I would, I'd, I'd like to show that you are actually testing the app on a real device. So allow me to change to my camera so that okay. everybody can see that. All right. Could everyone see my camera? Yeah, that's clear. Deanna? Yes. Thank you. So Deanna, would you please keep testing the okay. app? So this is the basic um, contact us page. It's a little bit different from the website. Um, pretty much you would submit all of your information and then you would scroll down and you would just click submit. And then we would actually get an email um, of whatever your inquiry is. So if you want to just scroll down here, if I put something in. And at this point, we would automatically get an email and we would like to tell um, everyone who would submit an inquiry that it usually takes up to 48 hours. Our app and website was designed for employees only. So they do know that it would take this amount of time for us to get back to them. Thank you, Deanna. And Jason's going to go over the inventory page. Of course. By the way, the handwriting is very nice. You're welcome. And now I'd like to go over the inventory. So the purpose of the inventory page is to search through our inventory and find parts for our airplanes. So allow me to demonstrate. First, I will type in the letter B. And as you can see, while the app is loading, while the app is loading, it's going to show every item that has the letter B in it. We've got bearings, bolts, bellows, more bolts. And when I click on the ID of an item, it's going to show me every single detail about that item. Now, I would like to thank some of our developers, uh, Goober and Deanna, for helping me to redesign the app completely and especially Armand to help me figure out how to make a table in this app. That's something we've been stuck on for a very long time. And without his help, we would have never been able to make this table that you see before you. So now that we've covered that, initially, this app was running on an iPad and an iPhone, but currently, 
they're being used by someone else. See, I'm not the owner of the iPad or the iPhone. My parents are currently at work, so I won't be able to demonstrate that, but I can guarantee it'll definitely run on the iPad once you download our app. So let me show you other devices that I can run on. You can see here it's running on an Android phone, but it also runs on an Android tablet. Allow me to turn on the screen. See here how it looks so similar to the mobile app. You've got your About page, your FAQ, Inventory, and the Contact Us page. And that's all the devices that I'd like to feature for our mobile app. It's unfortunate that our iPads and iPhones couldn't appear in this presentation, but there are, there are hardworking people who are using those devices right now. Okay, and now we're going to hear from Goober and the rest of our QA team, Matt and Armand. Hello, guys. I'll be explaining the QA and the test case size. Just give me a second so I can share my screen with you guys. Deanna, can you please confirm that uh, it's showing? Are you guys able to see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, you're good. Okay. So first I'd like to go dive into Wiki. We have created this Wiki as a location so we can have all our information in one place. It'll be easier to um, come back to and gather. As you can see, we have listed tutorials underneath there. And we have two separate files. The first one is for Alora, and the second one is for A Development. So we're just gonna go to here and we're gonna go and set a test case doc. On this page, you can see every, all the test cases we have submit and we have written for the project. Test case, have, test case have officially became the QH team best friends. Throughout this project, we wrote countless test case that helps shape our product features and give meaningful direction to the product functionality. They help integrate application features to ensure they work as the design. When we create a test case, we must efficiently and comprehensively convert the objective of, the, of our product into a test condition. It is a task that requires constant reference to the end product and the user experience. Here, I can show you guys an example. Let's just say this one right here, where the action tells the user to enter a valid email address and a valid password address. The objective would be to verify the user actually inputted the valid email and a valid password. The step that requires for this, I'm gonna transfer you guys to the actual website. The step that we require, I'm gonna log myself out since I was already in. You have to go to the main page, log in. The login is going to the those are already valid email address and valid password. So if I sign in, the next screen should have popped up with my name on the left corner of the screen, indicating that I am on my account. As it says, expected result should be the user is able to log in with inputted valid email address and password and have the user display on the left corner. The test plan, the QA team conduct that the best test plan for instance was to perform manual and automated tests during the development process. These different tests will target a specific part of the website function. We wanted to focus on data integrity and data integrity testing, function testing, and user interference testing and performance testing. When we speak on database integrity testing, it involves ensuring that the database assets, methods, process function are properly working and without any data corruption. When we do a test on the database server, we are testing how the, the user has access to the inventory and conduct inventory changes to the database, such as making edit to an item quantity or the complete the complete removal of an item itself. Function testing ensures that we have a proper application navigation, navigating, data entry and processing and retrieval. In a previous example from the valid login test case, for it to work properly, we had to go back and test on invalid emails so we can see if the website would work a set will work in a set invalid account. We expected the website to reply back saying that the email enter is invalid and it does not match with anything on the database. 
I could show you an example of this if I logged out or if a user had entered uh, on valid email, it would definitely send a message to the user saying that it wasn't able to retrieve. As is predicted, invalid login. We also perform interface. We also perform interface testing to verify a user interaction with the software. The goal of the UI testing was to ensure that the user interface provides the user with the appropriate access and navigation throughout the function of the application. On our main page, we have a button marked View Details. I'm going to show you again. On our main page, we have buttons marked View Detail. If this is not displayed properly, it is a big problem. This is this is one of potential hundred that will verify the user interference, ensuring that an individual element performed as intended. Checking element of the end user experience helped deliver the rock solid performance of the user the user deserved. As you can see, if I click view details, they actually work, and they make the website easier to browse to. And lastly, performance testing which measure the response time and other time sensitive requirement, the goal of performance. The goal of performance testing is to verify and validate the performance required have been achieved. Next, I'm gonna send it, I'm gonna, next is Armand explaining the manual testing. Thank you, Jay. Now, when doing testing, the main process of Hang on, I'm sorry, hang on one second. Something's wrong with me. All right, here. As mentioned before, manual and automated tests were used by the QA's analyst team. When we run manual tests on the software, we check all the essential features of a given application. In this process, the software testers execute the test cases and generate the test reports without the help of any automation software testing tool. We begin our test cases by compiling them with four columns labeled action, input, expected output, and actual output. Now the tool that we use to keep track of all these bugzilla was used as such. After running test cases, QA will then take the cases that have failed and will upload them to Bugzilla for the development team to see. And on, and on Bugzilla, each page would be given a type of severity that could range from major to trivial, which would let the development team know uh, which bugs need the most attention. Now, our process for writing these cases would go like this. First, it would start off with basic testing, which is when we receive a new release, we immediately go into it and test each part of it as a user would to see if there are any new bugs or possible resurfacing bugs that are easily discoverable. After this, we go into documenting where we write <coughs> uh, more obscure types of bugs that Sorry, more obscure cases that may not be easy to find with numerous types of inputs that can be done. Next is the real test. Once uh, documenting is done, we then go into the release again and test each case in order to find hidden bugs and or possible exploits. We then write the result of each test, whether it was successful or failed. The last part is filing bugs, which is when they are found, they are finally submitted to Bugzilla with the appropriate product type, version number, and the severity. And now I will send it over to Matt to describe automated testing. Hi everybody, my name is Matthew, and with what I did, my, my part of the project was to um basically create the automated testing and with the automated software we will basically the test code with scripts and that would 
make the automated tests execute properly. Um, testers use uh, the appropriate automation tool to develop each test script and validate the software. And to use automated testing, we will use Selenium. And what Selenium is, is basically, um, it's an IDE software that is used to run automated tests um, on different browsers. Um, Selenium accepts different types of code languages like Java, Python, C Sharp. And with all of these languages together, it creates um, Selenium test scripts. Um, what Selenium does is sends um, the HTTP request HTTP request HTTP request to the um, to each command and the Selenium web drop the Selenium browser driver would deliver that to the website and that that is how the um, that's how the execution st execution status is sent to the HTTP server which then turns into automated script um, so and with the, we also use Eclipse to run our automated testing, which I will show you soon. And what Eclipse is basically a software application that allows people to write code using any language. And what we use it for was to write Selenium script. And here I will be showing you my screen so I can show you how we wrote um, our Selenium script. Can you guys please confirm that my screen is showing? Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Something yeah. else. Okay. So basically what I'll be showing you are five, six different types of cases, which is the main function functionality of our website. And that will be how to first log in. And then next you will be able to, I will show you to, I will show you how to gain access to the login page, I mean the inventory page. And then once I get on the inventory page, I will edit and I will um, edit um, the database. I would be able to, I'll show you how I was able to delete from the database and add a row. And when I add a row, I will show you the incorrect data. So I can show you what happens when you put incorrect data in it. And I will show you that what happens after you enter the correct data. To start, I will log in. So I'm just gonna, put the wrong password so I can show you what happens. And it should say invalid login. Once I run the test case, it runs through. And here it goes. It logs in invalid login because I had the incorrect password. So that would be uh, a good test case because it, sh it, it showed what I wanted it to show. So then I will put in the correct password and I will be on the account main page. So I run it again. And each time I run a test case, it goes through the whole process of logging in and then going to the next step. So here I put my the correct information in and now I'm on the account homepage. I know I'm on the account homepage because I have the different tabs at the top and at the left it says, hello, Matthew. So now I go back. Now I will show you guys how I gain access to the inventory page using this function right here, the inventory test login. And with the dot click here, it's telling the computer to click on this inventory right here. So once I run it, it will do exactly that. It puts the login information in successfully. And now I'm on the inventory page here. The next thing I will show you is how to edit from the inventory page. So to start, I'm going to enter in the incorrect data. So I will hey man, we, have a, we have a question from Creature. He said, did you have to type in all that from scratch for the test cases? Uh, yes, I have to type all this in from scratch. Uh, so basically here, so like I showed you guys before, this part right here would be me logging into the inventory and gaining access to the inventory page. Once I get on the inventory page, there's a button, edit row, there's an edit button here. So what happens is this command 
edit row dot click will click on the edit button and once i get there it's going to pop i'm going to show you guys i click it and then the edit page pops up once the edit page pops up i get this bin number the dot clear command makes for this bin number is going to remove all the ones here and it's going to be empty so i could put in my own command here i'm just going to show you guys real fast so so you guys to have a clear view of what I'm saying. So I'm just going to show you guys the dot clear command to backspace all of the information that was there. I run it again. It's going to log in. Then it's going to go to the inventory page. See, everything from the bin is gone now. So now I'm going to put in incorrect commands. So I can show you guys how I respond, how I expect the computer to respond. And right now I'm just showing a failed text case, which is expected. It logs in. And as you see, it says for stock to enter a number. So I go back to, sorry, I go back to here. I enter a number for stock, put nine. For IOP, I have to also enter. And I have to have less than 10 here. So I've access this to make sure it's less than 10. Now I run it again. So now everything is being entered incorrectly and submit data. So now just to just to check to see if everything was submitted, uh where is the search bar? The search bar, I can put in this command. I mean what I typed in, the UD eight four eight seven four seven into the search bar to make sure the edit was correct. So UD eight. And as you can see here, I have the UD8747 and today's date as well with the stock on the database. So that's how you know everything was successful. So now I can go back and I, I can also delete. So a new thing here would be the delete row. And that is, let me show you on the database would be right under edit, delete here. So once I click delete, I will expect to get the, um, the confirmation page. So I run the test through here. <clears throat> and the delete row dot click here will allow me to enter the database successfully and bring me to the delete confirmation page. So now I'm on the delete confirmation page. Um, I'm not going to actually delete it, but as you see, it works. But with this command here, confirm delete dot click, it will delete what I asked it to. So now I will show you guys how to add row. With add row, I'm going to input incorrect data. So I can show you guys what happens when you input the incorrect data. So I have all these different IDs here, and I'm going to show you on the website, the ID. So I click add item. And then after I click add item, I get a function. Excuse me, let me do that here. So I click add item and I get this function popping up and I'm gonna be inputting data into this function into each bar here. So I go back here, I run the test and each one is gonna say input user input data. Runs through the same steps again. It clicks add item. And then it 
puts user inputs data throughout the whole page. And then it gives me another um, error. And I go back to fix the error. This is the correct data here. I have the correct uh, data for bin number, for con meta, supplier, distributor, manufacturer, and the rest, as you can see. So, and I also at the bottom, I have the dot click for the add button. I'm gonna show you guys where the add button is. So it will click on this button at the bottom here. It will click on this button at the bottom here. Excuse me. So I'll run this case. And as you can see, it logs in again, goes to inventory page, it clicks add item, and then it puts all the correct information in. And then just to make sure everything was successful, I go back to see the information I input it. So you, I'm gonna put the U00045 in, just in the search bar, U00, and as you can see, the U0045 was added today, May 11th, with all the information, L5 wings, the, the L45 for the lot, the wings for description, the stock quantity 1,465. And just to confirm, that's all the same information here, L45 wings, 1,465 for stock quantity. And that is basically what and how I would confirm for every test to make sure everything was running properly. All right. Uh, thanks for that explanation on Selenium and Git. Thank you. And now I would like to talk about testing the mobile app. Now, when testing the mobile app, usually it can only be done through manual test cases, and nobody ever talks about automated test cases. So I wondered, how can I automatically test my mobile app? So I, I found a way to do that, and it's by using two different kinds of software called SourcePy. SourcePy is a software that lets you mirror your Android device onto your computer. And I also had to use AHK, which stands for Auto Hotkey. And Auto Hotkey is going to control the Android device by writing scripts and clicking on the Android device. So allow me to demonstrate that really quick. Allow me to turn on my camera and let me know if everybody can see my camera. Anybody? Yes. Yeah, you go. Thank you. So now I'll demonstrate with both of my hands in front of the camera, my automated test case. See how I don't have to do anything while testing my mobile app. It's going to go through every item in the database and search for it. So you see, this makes it, easier to to test every item in the database instead of having to type it in manually. So there are plenty of items in the database, so I won't go through every single one of them. So I believe all we'll get that. We can see the uh, I don't think it went it actually showed. Oh excuse me? I don't think the uh the present actually showed. Uh because the viewers can't see the app. Oh, that's. Would you mind stop, stop, stop um, presenting and try presenting again, because it didn't fully show. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll try. I'll do that again. Give me a moment, please. So we've experienced some technical difficulties. So here's what I'm going to do. Goober, would you like to talk about your thing and then go back to me? Sure. 
Um, meanwhile, you get that settled down. I'll be going over the numbers of take the counts of number of test cases we have and the number of bugs we have on Bugzilla. For the website, we have a total of number of 132 test case written, and we have 23 that failed. We have 109 that passed. We have a pass percentage of 82.5 and a fail percentage of 17.4. For the mobile application test cases, we've written 25, and we seven of them were failed and 18 of them were passed. Pass percentage was 72, and the fail percentage was 20, 28. For Bugzilla, for the web, for the website bug count, we have a total of 25, and the number of bugs that were fixed is 21. For the mobile application count, the total number of bugs found was seven, and the number of bugs fixed was four. And now we'll return to Jason. Yes, thank you. So while Goober was while Goober was speaking, I was busy fixing my camera. So let me go back to my camera right now. It's unfortunate that this is happening now. Things were getting good. So can everybody see my camera? Yes. Yes. All right, thank you. Better, better. All right. So I'm going to demonstrate that automated test case once more, and we'll finally get to see how it works. So again, I'm using SourcePy, a software to mirror my Android app and auto hotkey to automatically click on the Android device. We're going to test out the automated test case right now for my mobile app. All right, here we go. The moment we've been waiting for. Let's go. All right, see how I'm able to search through every item in the database without having to type anything in? And this is going to go through every single item. And unfortunately, we run I've run out of so much time that I'm not going to show all the show it all of those items in the database. So yeah, hopefully everybody gets the idea. This automated test case is going to search for every item in the database automatically. And that's all I have to show. And now we're going to present to um, Team Alora. They're going to now present their project. Thank you, Dana. No so um, you may be asking, what is Alora? Alora is a system that increases customer accessibility to laundry and dry cleaning services. Therefore, companies are provided with a platform to manage orders, services, and their staff. Oh no, your nanny is too old to do your laundry. What are you gonna do now? It's okay, your secret is safe with us. Our overall intention for Team Alora is to design a service that allows customers to place orders in a user-friendly manner and companies to manage their orders. To make this dream happen, we had to come up with a procedure that matches the requirements of our system. As you can see, this is our project charter. So this will basically describe the goals and deliverables and risk and issues that we come across in our timeline. The creation of Allura followed the system development life cycle. The system development life cycle is a project management model that defines, and, that defines the stages involved in bringing a project from inception to completion. Now we're going to get into the requirements analysis of the system development life cycle. So we interviewed a manager at a laundry company to learn about the laundry service and the business requirements we need to meet. At first, nobody on the team knew only the basics about dry cleaning, how dry cleaners run. Also to mention, Professor said, anyone who goes out there quality time to find a client could possibly get extra credit. So me and the project leader, Denise, walked up and down two broad streets to find a cleaners and could not find any dry cleaners. So we walked in circles looking for the dry cleaners and we found one on the map. At one point, it felt like we were on the track team at this point. We thought our extra credit was automatically going down the drain. We did not give up. We gave it one last try and we went out of our way during the semester to find a client who's the owner of a dry cleaning service. 
the client that we came across, name is Mark, who was able to open was open to describe the basic functionalities of how a dry cleaner's services ran. It is always important to engage with the customers and understand what they would like to get done. We learned the basics pricing of customers' items, orders, and how the manager must be able to oversee the status of customers' items and how to search for customer items who may place an order possibly months ago. The dry cleaning services that we visited is called Dry Clean NYC, which is located in, this, in, in the city as well. As you can see, these are systems requirements. So before the development started, we had to determine the requirements that needed to be met. The main functionalities uh, we want our website and application to have were allowing customers to be able to search, view prices for our co partner companies, being able to place orders with specific stores and track the progress of those orders as stores managers update them, and being able to view past orders with all the details. As partner companies, we want our business to be able to manage orders, add and update their services, create and manage staff accounts, and view feedback from customers as they create them. As you can see, we have other requirements. One important security requirement was for the website to have a SSL certificate to make sure other, connection, other connections are secure. Also, some of the resource requirements like trailer and wiki, which were very important for communications and documentation, software configuration and delivery requirements, which states how every week the lead developer will package the website with a set of instructions for QA to install and test, and verification, validation, and acceptance requirements, which outlines the standards for QA to approve the product. Now, now Majid is gonna explain the design. Now, now we are going to into the design of uh, SDLC, the software development life cycles. Before we started to develop, we wanted to have an understanding of the structure of both our websites and mobile application. Therefore, we drafted authenticator, authentic architecture diagram to determine this. Firstly, we have our proposed website architecture of our, of our customer interference. So as, as you can see, the box labels not authenticated present all the website, web pages that can be accessed by a non-authenticated user, while the authenticated box presents all pages that can be accessed by authenticated user. Secondly, we have our proposed website architecture for the business interface. We wanted a business interface to meet our business needs, so we decided to, it would be best to create a business interface separate and apart from our customer interface. It would, it, this way, it will be easier to navigate the website as a business company. Determining what we wanted them to ha have was quite a challenge, but we were able to do come up with a couple concepts and eventually agree on things. Our time in the computer lab was interesting, so we spent time on the board writing out different pages that we wanted to have and how we wanted them to navigate from one page to the next. So this is an example of what our business interface architecture looks like. Okay. Uh, you can see the long screen assignment through the sign up screen are all not authenticated, so you can access them without having to be signed in. Once you get signed into the system and you are authenticated, you will have access to the services, uh, order history, account, order now, tracking, feedback page. Uh, of course, these diagrams for our proposed system and the end result included a few changes. In order, to tra in order to track user interaction with our service, we uh, store useful data. We knew we needed a reliable storage location, a database. What we didn't know was what database would work best for our particular data we stored. We did research and found out that a local SQLite database file would be the easiest one to implement. So naturally, we chose that. This worked 
this worked well for this. Sorry, hold on. This worked for a while until we realized that database files don't play nice with source control. A few weeks and a dozen merge conflicts later, and we decided to cut our losses and permanently migrate to a remote MySQL database server for persistent data management. Now, to this day, we continue to use a MySQL database. We continue to use MySQL as a database management system of OLR. In our database, we store all of the information we need to make the user experience as painless as humanly possible. At Allure, we store a lot of useful data about our user name, or about our user name, address, login details. We also store data related to the orders you place, the stores you place them at, and even the feedback you send about the experiences using our service. At Allure, we believe that persistent data management is necessary to build the perfect user experience. Of course, when we talk about creating our actual website and our mobile application, we wanted to ensure that we had a great graphical user interface and design of both our website and mobile application was very interesting and was appealing to our customers. We use a software called Marvel, which is a software tool that allows great prototypes for both the websites, um, iPhone applications, um, Android applications. We're just gonna look at a few of those examples. So here are some examples of the prototypes that we created. You, in, the present, in the walkthrough, you see the difference between the actual prototype and what we actually created. But this is an example of our sign-in page for our mobile app and also the main page for our mobile app. And that is the screen. And then we have a prototype for what our website was, was supposed to look like, but it definitely looks different now. We spent a lot of time in the, um, the Tutoring lab trying to figure out how we wanted to um, do our website, how we wanted to design. Trust me, like crazy, um, choosing a background color was like one of the most craziest tasks. You think I would do something so simple, but that took us a lot of time just trying to decide what the background color is. But we were able to figure out everything and how we wanted to design both our website and mobile application, and we're happy with it now. The first task is was to find a home for our website. We decided to use Amazon Web Service to host our, our, our website for three major reasons. Number one, Amazon Web Services is easy to set up and gives you all the tools to easily manage your server. Second, it's very secure and reliable in turn, and the most important reason, it was free, at least for a year. Even though, the, even though AWS is easy to set up, as almost everything in this project, it was a new experience, but sooner than later, we got a grip on it. And what used to take me two days to complete now takes me 20 minutes. To create a lore, we use the PyCharm Professional ID. PyCharm Professional is by far one of the most versatile IDs for website development. It has built in framework support, rapid develop deployment technologies, a built in terminal, and even a toolbar for managing database schemas, database connections. To make our lives just a little bit easier, we use the we also use a powerful web framework called Django to aid in development of our website. We chose Django because not only is it powerful, but it's scalable, secure, and relatively easy to work with. Django all but eliminates the need to modify databases directly and allows you to generate and test complete websites with relatively few lines of code in a very short amount of time, aka an entire semester. When building a complex website like Allura, Django is a must. For all of our collaboration needs, we use Git source control management. Git allowed us to take to track changes made by every team member, divide up work, and collaborate when it counted. Even though it isn't a very beginner friendly, it is 100% reliable 99% of the time, making Git the obvious choice for Allure. To create our website, we needed some combination of various languages, Python, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and SQL if you include database management. Naturally, we immediately ran into our first obstacle. None of our development team had code in Python before, and we were a bit shaky about everything else. So, so before we could even begin developing, our first task was familiarize and refamiliarize ourselves with these languages. As you will soon see, we were able to tackle this obstacle and all others to create the website for our laundry and dry cleaning service, Alora. So for the mobile application, we understand that most users spend their time on the go and having to have a computer with them to place an order might be a challenge. So to solve this problem, we have designed the Allura app. 
We use Android Studio, which is an integrated development environment to put our project together. Android Studio is the leading mobile application software among professionals. We use two different languages, uh, which were Java and Android XML. Now we're going to implement the, now we're going to the implementation of the SDLC. We want to ensure that Allura satisfies the functional requirements, satisfies the business needs, operates as described in the user and operator manuals. In order to prepare for a, prepare for a situation we will likely face in our life, we were tasked with creating and packaging up releases of our website mobile application. These packages, along with detailed instructions on how to configure and run both the website and the mobile app, were sent to the quality assurance team for testing and to a dedicated server for production. Packaging up the website and mobile application was relatively straightforward. The true challenge began with drafting the unpacking and configuration instructions, which we ended up changing at least five times before concluding that everyone learns things differently. Yes, we struggled, but we worked hard, extra hard to ensure that the user didn't struggle as well. As you can see, these are our release instructions. And they're very long. To ensure users' needs were met, we drafted a user document. This document details how best to navigate both the mobile application and the website. It's important to know, however, that we, um, Allure requires customers to create an account, which in fact they will have to um, provide both their first name, their last name, their address information, username, passwords. This address information is used when creating orders, which is also filled as well. Um, as a lower account holder, you are have access to viewing or services, you have access to ordering, you have access to viewing your order history, and you also have access to tracking your orders. As you can see, this is our user document. Very long, we basically detailed every single piece of information needed to navigate our website. So what you do as a first time user, what you do to sign up, what you do to create an account, um, to sign in, what you do to place an order, tracking, and this document also has information on the mobile application as well and how to navigate. Alongside allowing customers to use our features through a web browser, we also provide a platform for customers to use the service through a mobile application. But the mobile application only supports customer usage. However, the Allure Laundry system is not only designed for customers. We also provide a web-based platform for partner companies to make orders, to manage orders, services, staff, and customer feedback. Now, I'd like to go through the product walkthrough. Okay, so welcome to our product walkthrough. So this is our website, Allura. Welcome to Allura website, and boy, this was a test at hand. We had many problems, but we overcome anyways. As mentioned before, we created our website using PyCharm and the Django framework. In order to make changes, we needed to use Git, which is a source control. But of course, when developing, many things can go wrong. Trust me, we lost code. We had headaches trying to figure out what errors were. We had uh, spent long hours. We had our 3 a.m. meetings probably every single night for the last three weeks, like trying to code everything. But we worked well as a team. We ensured that we were always knew what changes were made, especially when ensuring our commit messages, which is when we actually commit to the Git um, or repository. We made sure those messages were concise and to the point of what we were actually doing. And as mentioned before, before by our project manager, Allure was created to provide laundry and dry cleaning companies with a platform to increase their accessibility to their customers. It further allows customer um, companies to manage their orders, to um, add services, to add items for those services, to create accounts for their staff members, and to also view feedback from their customers. As a partner company offering your services through a website, you can do all those things. Allure also has two different interfaces. So we wanted to ensure that we had an interface for both the customer separately from the interface with the business person. 
However, the business interface is broken down into two parts, which is a manager and a staff. So there's a separate login for the customer, separate login for business. So the manager and staff, staff have different um, responsibilities. Of course, a manager can do more things than a staff person can. And you see during the project, um, product walkthrough of how those pages look. So firstly, we'll begin looking into the initial start up of Allura and the customer interface. The score is our staff. As you can see, this is for filling, this for the user to fill in basic information, first name, last name, phone number, email address, etc. So we this for so we collect basic information about the users so we could, you know, to help them providing our services. So I'm gonna create a go through creating a new account now. And as you can see, there's some validation. And it's on the sign up page as well. And there correctly, I'm taking to another page for filling in address information. This address information we use to easily to make it easier for the user to place orders later later when they have to create their account we use autofill we use take this um, address and use to autofill the um the ordering so i'm going to enter in address actually let's see that Actually, when I change this number, so can we make for this? It will tell you, please provide a valid address. Not only that, it also detects if, uh, if uh, an address is a building or something that needs more information to properly narrow it down. See how it tells me a valid apartment or street is required for this address. So I entered an apartment. And, to, and it redirects me to a confirmation page. It sends me an email where I would uh, I would click the link in the email and um, activate my account. But for speed, I'm going to skip uh, actually waiting for the email and uh, go ahead to log in. Before I log in, actually, also, something to note is that we have a, a term of use for all our. And it's a pretty standard terms of use for, you know, it's, it's pretty long. People don't usually read these, but we have it and it's pretty cool. So let me go to login. There's also a forgot password if you forgot password. Or tells you that you send me an email for that password. All right, now let's go ahead and sign in with an account that was already uh, uh, All right, now I'm signed in. Can view my account, make changes to it, it saves. I can also place an order. Uh, let's go back. See the first part, the user chooses their store. There's only one store um, we're partnered with right now. But you know, if we add more, if we partner with more, the, uh, the user will see them here. 
and this is where the user schedules their pickup. As you can see, their address is automatically filled in and they can schedule their time. If they schedule it for right now, it'll tell the user the pickup date must not be earlier than one hour from now to give us time to prepare. So I change it to, I, I'm gonna change the date. And now it's telling me to schedule my drop off. And again, it auto fills the address. I mean, we could change it if we want, but I'm gonna leave it alone. And I'm gonna schedule it for the same, for May 11th. And as you can see, it tells me the drop off time must not be earlier than one day after the pickup date and time to give us time to actually, you know, process the order. And then as you can see, the order is confirmed. Uh, hey everyone, so I'll be discussing further about the customer um, interface or the customer side of the website. Just to confirm that you guys can see my screen. Yes. Okay. So one thing to know about our website as well is that we do have tooltips on each left corner. So the tooltips basically provide information on how to navigate our website. You can either click off or you can just click on the tooltip and disappear as well. Um, as a customer, you can also um, view the services of a company. So right now we only have one company. So I click find prices, it will take me here. So I'm gonna choose Allura Laundry by clicking the drop down and search. And this will provide a table with the company information and the address, and also the services that they offer and the prices for those services. As you can see. We also have a page called About Us who just gives basic information on what Allura is. Okay, so what I will be explaining is, um, is order details. So I'm gonna go back to the main page. And as a customer, we wanted them to be able to view their information about their orders and also track their orders. So first we're gonna start off with viewing the information about the orders they've placed with different companies. So this page provides a list of your order history. So all the orders that you've created, as you can see, Ahmad created this order on today at 3.21 p.m. And the status of the order currently is being processed. So we can search for order. So let's say I search for an order number six and it will provide me with order number six. So if I want to view specific information of the order and the tooltip does show you how to do so, I will click on order number six and it will show me information about all the order, the order information. So the order details, the name of the customer, the pickup location, the drop-off location, the time, the date, the status of the order, and if there's items and the price. Of course, when an order is actually picked up, it's the business responsibility to enter all the items that they collected. So that'll be done on the business interface of things, but we'll get into that soon. So I'm just gonna go straight from order details and I'm going to go into track your order. So we wanted customers to basically be able to track their order. You know, they could be sitting at home and be wondering, hey, where's, what's the progress of my order? So we have a page that allows you to do so. So if you select this drop down, it will show you all your order numbers. So of course, if I, another customer had an order, say it was order number 31, it will appear here. So if I click on order number three and I click here, it will say that the order is currently being processed. If I click order number six, Right now, the order has been picked up. So the business will basically update the status of the order, which will be reflected on the customer interface. So no matter what, if you decide to search for your um, order and track it, it will show exactly where the order is at. So now we're gonna go on to contact us. So we wanted um, our customers to be able to give, give feedback where necessary. So if they had a problem with something, or something went wrong with the order, they can contact us with a message, or they could simply just leave a message that says, hey, nice job, or something of the sort. 
So I'm going to go ahead and choose a store. Currently, the store is laundry. Again, the tool took is here. Um, the subject, we, I'm going to put the subject as dry cleaning and I'm going to enter what my message is. Thank you for your wonderful service. And then I'm going to click submit and my feedback was submitted. Of course, the business will be responsible for um, sending an email about addressing the issue or just saying thank you for just being a wonderful customer. Let's go back. And that's how you create submit a message. So this is basically what the customer interface is. You can place an order, you can track your order, and of course you can view your order history and contact the business when needed. So I'm gonna log out and we're gonna move on to the business interface. So now I'm going to present the business interface. Bear in mind that managers and staff accounts have different features. If you want to log in, you will have to use the, the business login. I'm able to log into here. So if I try to log in as a customer, it me is an invalid login. It's a manager login. This is the business side. So every time a manager comes in, he he's presented with these different uh, different tabs. So you can view your account, your current orders, order history, the services, your staff, customer feedback, and your information. You know, which you can do the same as customers. You can change the first name, last name, make any edits you want to your account. So let's make all the manager. You can see now. Let's go to the current orders. Which all the the reason we created this page was for uh, businesses to be able to easily uh, track all the in process. So only orders that are currently being processed will show here. Orders that are completed their page. So these are all the orders we have right now that are currently processed. So if, uh, let's say, a manager wanted to see details on an order, they just have to click the order. And it'll take you to the order details page, which you can see the customer name, the pickup location, drop up location, pickup date time, and drop up date time, the status, and the items. Also here, after you pick up the, the order, you add items. So if I want to add, Pants, I can do day 11, you know, automatically calculate how much uh, the, the total price. Let's say if I wanted to add another, like a blouse, also uh, two blouses, oh, early calculate. Let's say you made a mistake and you wanted it to take out items, so you can just order. Also, my ultimate said, uh, stores are responsible for updating this, the order status. So here you can update the status. You can do process, pick up, cleaning, complete it, and route. So we're gonna change it, update it. As you can see, it was updated. And also, a store changed the drop off date time just in case they needed more than a day to complete the order. So here you can edit the edit, you can edit the drop off time. So they, so we're gonna edit it to if it's seen. Give me a second. Uh, yeah, it's just like it's my internet connection, sorry. So 15, 2020. It was changed. Order history, where you can see all the orders. You can search for all specific orders, and it will show you all the orders, uh, current orders and, and orders that are already completed, 
will be here. So let's say if I want to search for an order, let's say number six. So show me, I can also do the same as the current orders and click and it'll show me all the details. So now Denise is going to continue explaining the business side. I will be um, bringing up my screen currently. Okay, so Arberto went through how you can view your current orders, how you can view your order history, and make changes to the order by adding items, deleting items, changing the drop-off time, and updating the status, of course. But before, you, in order to even add an item in the first place, the business person on um, the business company would have to patch services. And we've created a page that allows businesses to basically enter their services and the items that are under those services. So let's go to the services page. So here's our services page. As you can see, our company, which is um, Allura Laundry, that's where we're signed into now, is the services that they have is laundry and dry cleaning and wash. So if they wanted to add a new service, they can add a new service and also add a new item. So let's go ahead and add a new service. Uh, let's call this household items. And the store will pop up based on the store that you're logged into because each um, manager account is connected to the store. As you can see, the service popped up, household items. So let's add an item to this. Um, let me call this a pillowcase. As you can see, household items is now there. And I'm gonna add a price. Let's make my price $10. That's it, right? <laughs> For pillowcase. Okay, so now we have a service. But we want, what if you no longer offer a service and you're like, oh, I need to, um, I don't want my customers to be able to see the service or think that they can get the service from my company. So I can go ahead and just delete the item if I want to. And as you can see, the item is deleted and I can also go ahead and delete the service. And the service no longer exists. So we're gonna move on to our staff page. So we, create, we wanted managers to be able to create accounts for their staff. So the staff wouldn't automatically be able to just create sign up and create an account. So the man, it's the manager's responsibility. So as you can see also, not to mention, we do have tooltips here on this page as well. So let's go ahead and create a staff account. So I'm just gonna enter my name. I'm going to enter my password. Did you, did you see the pop up? And if I do this, it will also show that the password is in a match, so I have to re enter the password again. So now the staff account was created and now you can see my name, Denise Daniels, my username is Denise and my email. Of course, a staff a person can sign in and change that information using our view account page. So when they do sign in, they'll be able to change their password if they want to. All right, next we'll go into looking at our customer feedback. So remember when I created feedback as a customer before and here it is. So Berza had changed, um, Ahmad had changed the, um, the last name of the customer. The first name still remained the same. This is their email, dry clean, and I said, thank you for your wonderful service, and here it is. So basically the companies will know what email address to send these emails, responding to any information that they would like to know. We also have a general information page, which just provides basic information on the website, and also you can add locations 
based on zip codes and information about tracking. So what each tracking item means. So for instance, order process is P, order has been received by the company, or D, order delivered, order has been delivered back to the customer. So yes, this is our business side and we're gonna go next into our customer account. I mean, or staff account. So I'm gonna go ahead and log out and Ahmad will continue the presentation. As you can see here, business um, employees also use the same login as, we saw the same login page as uh, managers because, you know, business. And as you can also see, business um, staff, employees have much less options than um, managers. They can view their account. They can, um, you know, view order history. Uh, go back, view current orders. And that's all, that's all staff can do. And then now I'm gonna go ahead and um, you can also, you know, view details about an order. And now I'm going to log out and turn it back over to Denise. So that is our presentation for our website. So just to summarize, we had a business side and a, a customer side. The customer side being able to um, place an order, to track an order, to uh, come, um, submit feedback, and also to view their order history. And we also had a business side where they're able to manage their orders. They can view the order, add items to the order, delete items. They can update the status. They can view the feedback. They can create staff accounts. They can add services and add items and so much more just to help um, navigate everything. I just want to piggyback that most of these requirements, thankful to Ray that he went to the actual interview with the laundry owner, um, laundry company owner, he was really able to give us a lot of insights on the things that we need. So we've accomplished a lot with this website. And we've learned so many things like just, first of all, coding in Python and using PyCharm and everything was just, you know, great and amazing. In total, we had, we're just gonna do some statistics. In total, we had 321 commits. We had over 926 files and over 200,000 lines of code. So yes, we're gonna move on to our mobile application. So now you guys are probably wondering, can I use this software on a mobile device? Of course you can. Our team member, Miguel, would like to give you guys a tour on how to use Alora's mobile application. How's it going, guys? So creating the mobile application was an uphill battle, and it was no easy task. It took countless hours to complete this project. We ran into so many problems from crashes to debugging issues, and let's not mention the current global pandemic. But we did not let any of these issues stop us from putting our project together and achieving a goal. Without further ado, I would like to welcome you to the Aloha mobile application. Let me know if you guys can see it. Can you guys yeah, see the screen? Yeah. All right, perfect. As Denise mentioned earlier, we had a significantly different uh, design and we have changed so drastically from the beginning design that we had. Um, I would like to start off the presentation by signing up in your account. First name, last name, the email. numbers optional I'm gonna register the account once you're registered the account goes straight into signing in instead of having to sign back out into the login screen and having to sign back in so we would like to first off, start by going into our services page. You 
it's just like this, the here we'll load all the stores that we have. We only have one partner store at the moment. Once you click on it, it gives you the rundown of what they offer. So before you place your order, you know how much you're gonna pay. Then I would like to head on now to place an order. Select the store and put in the address. Check a date too. Gotta make sure it's an hour ahead. The main reason why we do two different drop-off location is in case that someone is not currently at their home and they would like to get the delivery somewhere else and maybe at their job, um, at the gym, on the way home, they can get arranged. Give it some time for our order to process. And let's place the order. Your order is being processed. Now, if we go into order history, here's our order. And you click on the arrow glass, it gives you all the detail from the order. The status of the order is currently processing, the store you selected, uh, the pickup time, drop off time. Then we would like now to go to our tracking page. that's processing, which is, we just placed the order, so makes sense. Um, next, we would like to go into our profile page. So like the app, you have access to change the user's info. You can see I was successfully able to change my first name. You can also have access to changing your password, if that's something that, you would like to do. So it's good to change your password after so long. Password successfully changed. So I'm going to log out. I'm log back into the account. And lastly but not least, if you enjoyed our services, you can give us a feedback or if you didn't enjoy our services, we can also get constructive criticism to improve our app and improve our services in general. You see, we added validations to make sure that you at least add a sufficient amount. Feedback received. And that is it for the app. Um, this has been such a constant battle. Um, in total for our Android application, we have a total of 123 commits and 223 files. Um, and we have 107,000, uh, we have 10,717 lines of code. Uh, now, lastly, I'm going to send it on to Amanda. Actually, actually, now we are going to go into the maintenance testing of the SDLC. Hey guys, 
it is important to our Lord to make sure that both components work pro properly and have no defects. So Laura's QA team came together and formed a test plan. On the test plan, we discussed our test methods. Our methods for testing were automation and manual testing. For testing the website, the QA team have it, had its own server for testing. And for our mobile application, there was an APK file that was up. Um, our tools that we use was Bugzilla. Not only did we use Bucking Bugs, we also used it to for enhancement to put down like what we think could have been better or you know, stuff like that. We also use AWS and Putty. This was to um, unpack the, uh, the website and to bring it up for our testers to properly test on the website. And we used Eclipse. Eclipse we use for a Selenium, just like the other group. Um, before we get into manual testing, um, I wanna give you a little background about our manual tester, Ray. Now, Ray, he was our project manager, right, Amat? Yes, yes, he was. There were those long nights when we had to sit up with him for like six hours trying to explain to him how to properly do manual testing and stuff. Oh boy, let me tell you, it was it was a it was a tough time, but he learned it and uh, he was one of our best manual testers. Um, so I'm gonna let him explain it to you what it is. And for those hard working hours, I appreciate you guys putting the time in and helping me out to create manual test cases. So yes, I admit it, folks. I was the hard-headed project manager that did not know how to create a test case to save his own life. I was more than glad for my team members to show how to to show me how to create a test case before we all rejoined in class and hear the professor on a rant on why it is not done from 6 to 9.45. And that's on a good day. Class usually went up to 10 p.m. I wouldn't have been surprised if the entire class had to sleep over at 2 Broad Street in the lab to get capstone work done. Before testing anything, you want to understand the basic concept of manual testing. My objective is to ensure that the application under test is defect free and it is working in conformance to the specified functional requirements. These are the different fields that I will look at to make sure every basic function of the website is running smoothly. With the help of Eddie and Ahmad, test, testing involves reliable and repeatable, designed during the test phases and should have 100% test coverage checks the quality of the system, and most certainly time consuming and delivers bug-free products. The goal is user friendliness or improved customer experience. Here, I'll do a demonstration of manual testing. The first example will be of password validation afterwards when we create it, and then I'll show you guys how to create an account. So let me uh, go on, go on to Laura, all right. So let me know if you guys see it. See a Laura's page. All right. Yeah. So the steps that are needed to get to the basic information page to create an account, we're gonna this is step one, you select the sign in button. And since I don't have an account because I'm a first time user, I'm gonna click the sign up option below. All right. So we're gonna put in our information. And the email address is name is going to be and let's just create a, a password that doesn't have any alphabet or uppercase letters or any numerical numbers. So we're just gonna put Apple to the world. Apple to the world. And we're gonna we're gonna select on well before we select the continue button, I want to make an assumption of what the results will be for this latest version. So this latest version that we're showing you is version 1.5 for our production server. So my expected result is that the user is informed that their character length for password is too short. Alphanumerical numbers are needed and so are capital letters, as well as uh, symbol characters. So I'm gonna select on the continue button to see the actual results. Oh, all right, so this is what happens. The password must contain at least one digit from zero to nine. The password must contain at least one uppercase letter, A through Z. The password must contain at least one symbol, of course, parentheses or brackets, 
or any specialized character, explanation mark, et cetera. So now, now that we're informed that this is uh, this notification pops up for the user that they can't just create any password. Now we know the requirements that are needed to create on the basic information when you sign up. So we're gonna create a, we're gonna create a password based on the information that was provided on what I need to create a valid password. Okay, so now I'm on the sign up address information page. So we're going to put in valid information on the address information page. So let's just use my home address. Okay. And then it's required you have to select the state. So we're gonna call, we're gonna select New York. All right. Just waiting for it to load. Did you click it? Yeah. <laughs> you know my laptop's kind of old, so. <laughs> So what happened was basically the ad the email address already exists. So we could of course we could just use a different um, email address. Well, that's another another notification that pops up if uh, if your address information already exists and you're trying to create another account. Let's use uh, oh, yeah, that was no good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Just put the correct information. Okay, now uh, Y2 plus underscore. Uh, things like this happen, so we got to make sure everything is correct. Oh, all right. So I think so. Something something's going on because the email, email address already is already it already email exists. Dot com. Right there. Sorry, Eddie. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Small to the world. Yeah, it's the it's the small things. So things like that might happen. All right. Give me one second. Let me fill out this information. It's usually some things like that happen. Just make a password that match. Of course. No worries. All right, thank you. <laughs> so we're gonna put in my information one more time.
All right, so my account is created and I would be able to log in, of course. And that's how you successfully create an account. And now Eddie would like to take over to discuss to you all about Selenium scripting. All right, thank you, Ray. Of course. Now in the early stages, early stages of educating myself about Selenium scripting, every Thursday within the first hour of class, Professor Khan would give the QA team a beat down about Selenium scripting. I mean, it was a beat down. <laughs> but every day this will haunt me in my mind to get it done. Eventually I grasped the concept and began scripting. I will now show you a result of my studies. So here I have over 300 codes written, but the methods that would be called would be login and order up. I put my test cases into method headers because it will be much simpler to run. So I'm going to run it and show you guys what happened. You guys see it, right? Yeah, we see it. Okay. So signs in to the customer account. And then it begins to make an order. Okay, thanks to our beloved, <laughs> develop, our beloved developer lead who also added an autofill. Sometimes this can happen. You're welcome. <laughs> thanks. So, so sometimes when they, they make changes, we have to go into our script and edit everything. So it'll be the same problem here. Just the, just the apartment. And then just click continue. And the order was confirmed. Sometimes you get an error when presenting, but that's part of uh, Selenium scripting. Now I'll give it to uh, Ray. Thank you, Eddie. So, of course, through the numerous hours of hard work that was put in, our favorite team member, Majid, would eventually arrive to the rescue and ask the team, are you there? Of course, it was a simple question because we were already in the meeting for hours. But I realized that the reminder of, are you there, showed us that Nobody on the Lotus team is ever left behind. And as an insider, Professor will understand after giving both, both the teams the beat down and Majid will ask the billion dollar question to Professor. Professor, are you there? Okay, <laughs> now to pass the torch on to Majid to discuss how automation testing users framework was used for Allura. All right, it is a long day. Okay. Uh, automation testing, you, testing, I use a framework uh, to do to conduct the automation testing, uh, I using Apache POI for reading and writing to any documents. Uh, writing a JavaScript in Selenium Selenium is a good way to test the website. However, changing the data in your script it could be very tedious. Every time you run your script, you have to change data in your script. It could be it could be a good option for a small website, but for a large web and medium uh, website, using a framework to test the website is very handy and less tedious. For that reason, I prefer to use data-driven framework that are integrated with the text file for input. Okay, how it works. The way it works, the technique they use uh, for the framework, data-driven framework, uh, they, they use uh, the data driven framework uses for separating the data data set from the actual test code. This, frame, this framework completely depends on the input test data. The test data is fed for, for, from the external source files such as the notepad and CSV files. And uh, 
the, it, it does not come easy, uh, to be honest with you. I first I installed I to install the Apache uh, website with some file for jar file. It required few stuff, few files to install on the on the existing Selenium server. So uh, first time I installed it, it, it didn't work. So I installed after that all of them. So now my so the Selenium was gone completely. So I have to redo it all over again from the from scratch. So it it is a little delicate when you deal with a little uh, when you deal with the framework compared to script. So I'll give you the example. How did I use it? One second. Oh, just one second, uh, one second, I'm getting there. Because I'm using different computers, so that's why. All right. Okay, so here's the framework that I use for a little sign up page. You see, there is no, I, I didn't have any data that, uh, any, any test case that I written in my script, in my framework actually. So there is, a, so what it does, it will take input from the external source. External source is a text file. I show you over here. So it takes a one by one all the input from the text file, but it does not contain any test case inside the script. So let me run it. I use the Fire, Firefox driver, so it's a little slow. Okay, yeah, there is a, uh, the, I, didn't, I didn't put the complete address. So that's why it's a giving error. When you put the complete address, it's take it. Let's go for the beginning. I wanna change uh, the telephone number to see if it's work. I just put the first four number of the telephone the phone and save it and run the framework. You see the number I put it, it says the system uh, or server say the number the phone number is enter is not valid so it does not take in any incomplete input so I have to change in the text file so I save it then I run again. So yeah, it takes it, uh, well, I forgot to change the street address. I have to change the street address as well. Forty Devi Street, I used to live there. Ooh, I'm sorry. So 
Let me run again and it should work fine. All right, yes, go. Okay, the all changes that are whatever I made in the text file, it took from this text file and put in the, and save it in the server. So you can see this file in example, if you log in, oh. Well, the funny thing is it, <laughs> the framework changed my password, so. And I'm not thinking really. It's uh, well, everybody know my password. I don't know. One, two, three. So it, it takes my, I show you the edit page. Current accounts. Yeah, whatever I made, you see that the changes I made is all there. So it works fine now. Now I get back to the Raymond to continue to finish up the project. One second, let me get sign out. All right. All right. So now Eddie will talk about the stats and bugs and of how many bugs and uh, has been filed throughout the semester. All right. Thank you, Ray. Of course. Our website stats for test cases, we had a total of 254. 205 passed and 49 failed. That's a 80.7. Uh, pass rate and 19.3 percent fail rate 128 bugs was filed for the uh, website 115 were fixed and 13 were not fixed our mobile app stats there were 67 total test cases 45 passed and 22 failed 67.2 pass rate and a 32.8 fail rate 39 bugs were filed all were fixed now i'll give it to right now thank you eddie so no of course, I want to wrap everything up. I want to say thank you all for your quality time today. Both teams, Team Allure and Team Essence, have spent some quite some time on both projects, more hours than we all could have expected. I'm going to be honest. I'm pretty sure on January 16th, first day of class, we all didn't know we, what we was getting ourselves into after the first 20 minutes of class. The professor telling us what Capstone is all about and what we'll be doing almost every day for this semester. This class did not only humble us, but told us what a beauty of the end result can be when you dedicate yourself. Commitment with others to meet with your group six days out of the week, maybe even seven. After the many disagreements, the good and bad days, we will carry that with us for the rest of our future careers and our lives. For that lesson learned, we all came down to the conclusion on what a great outcome, uh, on what a great outcome can look like when we all work together. Bloomfield College motto is write your own story, right? So after driving Professor crazy some classes, we could all say we have a story to write about. We would like to acknowledge and appreciate everyone who participated today in this presentation, starting from our team members, Professor Kong, Business Department Chairman, Professor Kruse, parents, family, and peers who decided to come out today. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you all. So, uh, congratulations. I think you guys did a great job. And uh, I heard a lot about a beatdown. Uh, I wish I could have been there to see it. Uh, it, was, it was a lot some days in the lab. Oh, uh, <laughs> I believe it was there. <laughs>